Good evening and welcome. Tonight is Wednesday, June 7th. This is the Hendrick Hudson Board of Ed meeting. The reason I'm just standing is we are already in session, but we can all please stand for the pledge of allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But we will begin. Um, turn it over to Mr. Hockfeder, who will start the retirement ceremony. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We dialed up some beautiful weather for today, finally. Uh, we're glad we're not meeting next week when it's 90 degrees. Uh, for those of you who are in the party planning profession, you would know that spring and summer are wedding and graduation season. And two weeks ago, uh, we had a marriage ceremony here as we granted tenure to a number of our teachers in education speak. We are marrying them for uh, hopefully a good long time for them to work in our district. And we have now pivoted to graduation season. And our elementary schools will graduate fifth graders to sixth grade, our middle school moving up ceremony, certainly our high school uh, graduation ceremony on June 25th. We are also graduating a number of district employees who have spent uh, collectively hundreds of years working in our school district, safely transporting students, educating them, supervising them, providing leadership and guidance to them, and their careers have spanned a very interesting era of public education. As the pendulum continues to swing and as our profession continues to become a political football, the individuals we're going to recognize tonight, I would suggest, have almost seen everything possible in our profession. From 1984, we had a study called The Nation at Risk about how our schools are not, or how our schools are underperforming and we don't have enough scientists, to President Clinton's Goals 2000, to No Child Left Behind, to whatever the acronym is today that we're operating under. Uh, the folks we're going to honor tonight have seen hundreds if not thousands of kids climb through their buses, walk through their hallways, and go through their classrooms. And our community, and our graduates, and our school district is much better off because of your service. So as we kick off tonight's ceremony, I want to thank the uh, individuals who are graduating from our school district this year I want to thank them on behalf of all of the children and the community members who maybe oftentimes didn't have the audacity or the ability to say thank you. So on behalf of all of them, we want to thank you for your service. To start tonight's ceremony. Uh, tonight's ceremony, I'd like to invite up, uh, invite up Dr. Matthew Swerdloff, uh, one of our executive directors who had some help in putting the recognition together. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody. Hi. I want to say thank you to the people who are not retiring tonight <laughs> for keeping us company. But I also want to say thank you to you folks, spouses, children, um, partners, brothers, sisters, for being here tonight for your loved ones. It's a really, really big night for them, and um, it's really important and it's really special that they're here supported, and especially to the colleagues that are here tonight, for your fellow teachers and bus drivers and custodians. I really appreciate that everyone's here tonight, and I'm happy to see so many smiling faces. Um, just to give you a little sense of the program tonight, we're going to have um, two uh, individuals that represent our um, two different uh, unions, going to speak briefly to some of their folks, and then we'll be starting with um, Anthony Merlini, um, and then we'll be going down to the high school and the elementary schools. So I'm going to start by asking Marie, Marie Manor, co-president of the Henry Hudson Education Association, to come and say some brief words. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, people on the board. Yes, I was told to be short and sweet. So, what an honor it is, though, to congratulate all of you tonight as you embark on your new journey in retirement. We at the Hendrick Hudson School District are indeed fortunate to have had the privilege of sharing our retirees' expertise, their work ethic, 
and their commitment to our students, our staff, and our schools. You have all left a remarkable legacy, one which will remain with us for years to come. You are leaving our HHEA a better place than when you found it, and that will remain a tribute to your professionalism. Remember us fondly, and may the years that lie ahead be filled with laughter, happiness, and much good health. This is our wish for all of you. As we say, so long, but not for farewell. And to steal a little line from Matthew, from the thousands of students you have taught, a very sincere thank you. members of our secretarial staff that are retiring this year, and I'd like to ask Kathy Brennan, co-president of the Hendrick Hudson Ed Educational Secretaries, Education, <laughs> H-H-E-S-A, <laughs> to come up and speak about these two ladies. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, so I'm just going to repeat what um, the community said, and thank you very much. That's That says what the secretaries are all about, too. The, um, that um, these girls that have worked here all these years have been truly a wonderful asset, not only to their buildings that they were in, but to the, um, the students that they help, the staff that they help every day, the people that come in. It's always surprising to me, the uh, people that come in and out of their offices and um, how they help them with everything. So, um, I just want to thank you guys very much. You will be so missed. You really will. And um, I want to thank you for what you've done for our unit. Anytime that anybody's asked you to do anything um, to help us, you guys have stepped up with the community and being on the board, and it's so appreciated. And um, I know that we're not going to never see you again. <laughs> so um, just wanted to say thank you. administrator will probably tell you that it's the secretarial staff in the building that really keep things running and it's yeah. not a cliche. Yeah. Yeah. And Emily and Laurie, we will really, really miss you. <laughs> um, next, Anthony Merlini is going to come up. Uh, Anthony uh, oversees the operations department and facilities and he has a couple of retirees that he's going to speak about. First retiree, I'd like to um, recognize is Tommy Camp. Tommy Camp began his career in the Hendrick Hudson School District in May of 83. He started as a night custodian at Furnace Woods Elementary School, but over the 30 uh, plus years he was here, he worked in almost just about every building, almost a lot of different capacities. Um, and then most recently, Tom was the mayor and supply clerk for the district, bringing around the mail from building to building, going back to the post office, making sure things got delivered. Sometimes he had to do the unpleasant thing of bringing OSS letters to the <laughs> students, but that's just part of the job. Um, what, some of the other things that he likes to do is very into NASCAR. He likes his racing. He goes to a lot of different races. We both share that same passion. He goes down to Daytona. He's looking to plan a trip near to Indianapolis 500, which I support. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing he likes to do is he likes to cook. He's a, he's a, he cooks a lot of meals, and sometimes what he does is he cooks corned beef and cabbage, and he brings it down to the bus garage when the custodians have their lunch breaks or something, or they're in between their driving shifts and they have a break. They'll come in and stop by on St. Patrick's Day, and Tommy makes that at the firehouse and brings it over to us, and we're able to partake in that too. It's a very nice gesture on Tommy's part. Um, and then he continues the local fire department as well. He's been on the uh, Austin fire department and on the local fire department as well. So he's served in the uh, volunteer capacity in that. And he also cooks for them as well. So Tommy is one of those guys who goes out this way to make sure a lot of his um, people are taken care of and that's what he did for us and he did for me. Making sure that um, he was the eyes and ears that went around 
making sure that everybody's getting what they need, they were sending complaints or anything was going on, he tried to alert me to those facts so I could go out there and take care of those things. So I'd like to recognize how we can and I'd like to wish all of you So I want to congratulate you on your retirement. 
and you will be missed. It will be very difficult to have somebody. I've done those fields. I started lacrosse league with my son and running it. I don't know how you get the fields to not be crooked, but you did it. So maybe come up and help me because it's going to be anarchy. But George, congratulations. Come on. Julia began her teaching career at St. Patrick's School right here in Burplank, correct, Julia? 
And uh, prior to coming to Head High, Julie also served uh, the children and families of the Peace Hill Presbyterian Nursery School. She also served as the director of Lakeland Children's Center. We'll forgive you for that, Lakeland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and in 95, began working in the Head of School District Special Ed Department as a home tutor. And then we quickly recognized her skills and we brought her on as a teacher assistant a year later. And then 1997, she was appointed. Um, as a teacher of special education in the district and was home, right? Um, I said this the other day in our faculty meeting, and we could go over the accolades of, of all these folks who would take a long time. Um, Julia truly loved her kids, um, and there was never a conversation that I had with her that didn't start off about kids. And I'd say, Julia, well, we have to talk about this, or we have to talk about the parking spot. She's like, I just have to get back to my kids, Jim. I need to serve my kids. And, and even in times of great personal challenge, um, her focus was her kids and always how does she get back to them. Um, and you know, I, I want to tell you, Julie, that you will never leave the students that you taught. I've been in your classes, that little self-contained class that you had right above my office. Um, and you will never leave them. You will always be with them um, for the things that you taught them. So I want to congratulate you. I know you have a, a long, healthy life in front of you with your wonderful husband. And we've talked about your beautiful relationship. And I want to wish you a great retirement, uh, traveling and going to your trailer and camping and doing all the things that you guys love to do. So congratulations. Come on.
appreciate that. I appreciate your advocacy for students and the, and the energy that you brought. I also appreciate the way that you coached our youth. Um, you had state champions, sectional champions, individual and team uh, league champions, and brought many of our teams back to prominence after a short hiatus from, from coaching. So I want to thank you for your 37 years of service, and you too will be uh, someone that will be very hard to replace. Uh, I wish you the best of health, and you have many plans in your retirement, um, and you will be missed. Uh, so congratulations, Paul. Thank you for your service.
and I equate it to one of the challenging times in my life. You know, when my dad died 10 years ago, I never expected to live life without him. And I feel that way about you. I never expected my life here without you. And we spoke about that when, when I first came on. Um, she is, uh, Lori is not a secretary. She is a, an assistant, but a partner. Um, she is someone uh, that I respect a great deal. I respect her, uh, not only in her professionalism, but the way she carries her out her life, the way she loves her family, uh, the way she respects and loves her parents, and her relationship with her husband. Her relationship with Bill is something that's very special. It's something that is a model. Um, and, and I don't know if you know that I've watched that over the years, but you know, as a young man who needed to be straightened out a lot of times as a 35-year-old principal, it was very important to have somebody of your professionalism and ability um, and knowledge of the district to help me survive uh, and learn. Um, and I just can't imagine you not being here. And uh, I know I know where you live too. <laughs> but you'll probably be on some, annoyingly you'll be traveling with Bill and having fun and taking those pictures and with the family and your son and your, you know, it's, yes, yeah, I'm just hoping she doesn't call me John when she comes up here. Inside joke. But uh, seriously, um, I'm normally not speechless, but I can't imagine doing this job without you. I will journey on because I know I can call you at any point and you'll be there just like you were sitting out and waiting for me to scream, Lori! Uh, so congratulations, Lori. I love you. Uh, you deserve it. You serve this district. Uh, and you will always be a sailor to everybody that knows you here. Always, always, and always. Congratulations. Congratulations to all the retirees. Mr. Baker is seriously eating my dinner right now, so I have to go down and see our three students. We had three students in Wakan Ed this year. Adam Fisker, Jonathan Sean, Tim Cunningham. So Thank you, Mr. Mackin. Next, I'm going to ask Dr. Cindy Kramer to come on up. Cindy is the principal of First Woods Elementary School. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. I have um, two retirees that I'm going to speak about tonight. First is Anne Constantine. Anne has been a social worker at Curtis Woods and at Frank G um, for 26 years. And during this time, I'm sure she has touched the lives of thousands of students. Whether it be with her lunch groups, her individual meetings with kids, or her classroom presentations of good touches, bad touches, Anne always has a way of building a positive rapport with each student that helps them feel comfortable and safe. Whenever I ask Anne for advice about how to address a situation, I know I will get a thoughtful and kind response. She listens carefully to all sides of the story and advocates for our most vulnerable students. No matter what, meeting the social and emotional needs of her students is always Anne's priority. Here's, some, here's what some of those students had to say about Mrs. Constantine. She's kind and quiet. She's nice and listens, tries to help. She's caring, funny, she's kind, she's awesome. She's exciting and cool. She lets us play games and talk to her. She listens to our problems and never yells. She helps us make friends. I've known her for a very long time and she's very calm and listens to me all the time. She helped me get over something that was bothering me a lot. Clearly, Anne has helped many children in many in more ways than we can imagine. The kids and staff will certainly miss her. We wish you happiness and enjoyment in your retirement.
Our second retiree at Furnace Woods is our office secretary, Ken Lee Martin. Okay. Secretaries make a school tick. They ensure that everything runs smoothly from scheduling of assemblies to distributing supplies and hundreds and hundreds of other things, too numerous to list. Kamalini is that person to everyone, including me. And she goes, I'm sorry, Kamalini is the person that everyone, including me, goes to when they have a question. If she doesn't know the answer, she figures it out, figures it out or makes one up. <laughs> she ensures that things get done. I again asked some of the students to describe Mrs. Martin, because they're always in and out of the office at her desk, and here's what they had to say. Joyful and smart, hardworking, puts a smile on your face, nice, helpful, determined. She does a lot for us. Generous, smart, and very organized. Kind, encouraging, good-hearted, wiser. <laughs> always there for us. We'll miss your voice on the announcements. <laughs> Kamalini is the first face most visitors see when they come into Furnace Woods, and she knows all the parents who are regulars and works with the PTA to organize fundraisers, events, meetings, etc. Here's what some of the parents have to say. <laughs> a kind, caring, steady, reassuring figure for parents and kids alike. The organizational center of the school. Mrs. Martin is caring and compassionate. She's always helpful and loving towards my children. She will be truly missed. She knows every aspect of the school and what makes it tick. I will miss seeing her smile when I come into the school, but wish her a fun and relaxing retirement. Kamalini has always made all families, but especially new families, feel warmly welcomed to the Hendrick Hudson School District. She patiently answers any questions we have with a smile and has always made our children feel safe, secure, and loved. She's caring and kind and the perfect example of someone who loves children. She will be sorely missed and will forever be appreciated. Furnacewood School is losing a wonderful person and we will miss you. Your kindness and thoughtfulness to our children was so helpful when our kids entered as kindergartners and much appreciated all through the years at Furnacewood School. I also greatly appreciated your help as well as your patience whenever I contacted the school office on any issue, scheduled appointments, the fair, PTA meetings, after school programs, beautification days. We counted on you to help and you always did. And I know the staff will miss Camelene tremendously. Teachers shared that Camelene is organized and knows exactly what needs to be done. She jumps in and does things before anyone else has a chance. And they're already wondering who will remind them to put their absences into ASOP in September and bug them to hand in requisitions next spring. Although I've only been at Furnace Woods for a few years, it's clear that Kamalini is much more than a secretary. She's a true friend to all of us, and we will miss her. We hope your retirement is filled with fun and much deserved relaxation. It's very happy, people getting married, having babies, and really starting off. Um, not that in retirement is not exciting for me or happy for me, but it's kind of hard for me. It kind of, kind of sits in your chest and it's really, really hard. Uh, because the fact is, um, we've been together for 10 years, Jerry. And in those 10 years, you've been one of my best friends. I also put you in charge of the crisis team, so when I was gone, if there was ever an emergency, you were in charge. And the first 
first day, the first day, the only day I probably took off, there was. And I have to say, you've been by my side. But most of all, you've been so close to the children. You care every day with what you do. That library is more than just a place to take out a book. It's a place to open young minds. It's a place for them to reach anywhere they wanted to reach and dream anything they wanted to dream. You just would never quit, even though we changed the program several times. You came every day with a smile on your face and said, how much more can I do? Let me help you out. Let's make it a place where they want to go, even though my time is small. And we got you back full time. It's been the best time of our lives again. Okay. And like they say, you know, we're a family, and we always make a good sauce, and you're an ingredient that can never be replaced. I just want you to know that, um, and you've showed me a lot over these 10 years. You know, patience, kindness, you're a wonderful, wonderful pillar in that building, and I will never forget you. Thank you, Shelby. I do want to um, also thank Ann Constantine. She was passing Frankie Lindsay where all your dreams come true and you made them come true. I want to be just like you, Ann. No matter what, you're always calm, composed, and has always been there when I needed you. You put a smile on every child's face and they look forward to working with you every day. Everything that Cindy said is absolutely true and I couldn't have said it better myself. So I wish you all the best. And to Jim, I know you did share the peppers with Tommy, but I'm going to confess that I was the one that stole Tommy's truck because he kept leaving it in front of the building with the keys in it. And I wanted to prove a point. So I was the one that moved the truck. <laughs> Uh, we have we have one more graduation, or one more graduate to recognize that is uh, not on tonight's program. Um, that is one of our school board members, and Charles Thompson is leaving the board of education after nine years of service, and in school board. Position, Nine years of service in school board years is about 106. <laughs> so they all I met Charles a little over four years ago when I was hired for this job and have built a, a great relationship with him. And if any of you have been to school board meetings or have watched them on film or been to any meeting that Charles uh, is attending or participating, you will know that he is one of the biggest advocates for all kids in our community. He has been persistent, he has been relentless, and has been an engaging force in our school community to make sure that we address systems and instruction and address the whole child with a very, very wide lens. And he was a school board member during very difficult times uh, in this particular community financially. Uh, he was a school board member uh, at a time when standards were changing and stress and frustration and, and our profession became increasingly uh, politicized by politicians. But he has offered and continued to be a relentless pressure point to making sure that this team is providing all the opportunities they can for all 2,400 students in our school district. And he will remind us of that every day. And it's important that we have people like Charles Thompson that represents our, our children. So Charles, on behalf of our school community and Board of Education, we have a graduation gift for you. Uh, we know that, that you will be missed. And we know that we'll be able to call upon you uh, as one of our steadfast members with uh, great history, with great intellect, and who knows where all the skeletons are. So please come on. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> Told me to open it. Most of our retirees graduate with a pension. Charles graduates with a pension. So, it's all, it's all we could do. <laughs>
So this is the end of our program. Before you all run off, I'm going to um, take advantage of this last opportunity to embarrass, to appreciate the retirees, and ask you to take a minute to look around retirees and just take in the love that is in this room for you and know that we all wish you well. And for those of you that would like to stay for the rest of the board meeting, we would be love to have you. And for those of you that want to exit, this is your chance. <laughs> All right, we'll move on now uh, to my brief uh, superintendent's report. As I said earlier, uh, this is uh, graduation season and recognition season, so we have uh, many uh, events during the day, afternoon, and evening. Mr. Mackin mentioned uh, three of our Con Ed award winners uh, are having dinner tonight and are uh, being celebrated for their athletic and academic prowess. Uh, we have our moving up ceremonies. Uh, the last week of school, there are three elementary schools in our middle school. Our high school graduation is at SUNY Purchase on Sunday, June 25th. Uh, we also have our three DARE graduations. Our fifth graders uh, at all three elementary schools uh, are wrapping up their DARE curriculum and will be recognized by the DARE officer that we work with. Uh, and our Honor Society and Academic Recognitions in two weeks, uh, on the 21st, our Senior Award Ceremony will take place here. That's also the evening of a board meeting, and uh, we're going to try to uh, move the board meeting along quicker so we can come and, and be a part of that recognition on the 21st. And the next day, on the 22nd, uh, is the Underclassmen Awards Dinner, which will also be here in the cafeteria. So, uh, if you're looking for something to do, check out our district calendar. You will have plenty of opportunities to be involved and watch our students uh, perform and be recognized. In particular, uh, tomorrow is the Frank G. Uh, concert, spring concert that will take place here at high school. So if uh, you want to get out and watch your kids and celebrate them, there is plenty of opportunity over the next few weeks. It is a wonderful time of year. All the positive stuff and culmination. Staff have with students. 
and climbers in Kabadi and many districts do things a little bit differently and we've been trying to investigate how we can use our instructional day um, for the most part at 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock uh, to try to make sure that we're meeting all of the standards as I mentioned earlier uh, our profession is changing rapidly uh, our teachers are expected to do more with the same amount of time uh, they're expected to teach higher standards at a, at a quicker rate and the accountability measures that have been uh, placed upon districts throughout the country in New York State uh, have escalated and fast forwarded decisions about how to do this different things. So I'm going to uh, let Margaret walk us through the elementary uh, schedule for next year. I know that uh, board members will have questions when this starts from the audience. Okay, all right. So um, it's my pleasure this evening to share this information. Uh, this has been a year and a half long conversation with the three elementary principals, superintendent, very often in cabinet, etc. So let's talk about what we talked about. The goals, time is always the conversation when uh, we're working with our teachers. It is the one thing that they constantly ask for more of that we can give them. Books we can give them, kids we can give them, but time is finite. So uh, when we embarked on this conversation, probably late last fall, not this school year, the school year before, these were our goals. To provide consistency in the elementary instructional day in both core and special area curriculum. To protect instructional time for the optimal delivery of core academic subjects, parentheses meaning longer blocks of time are necessary. To provide time for special services, intervention, and enrichment programs within the school day that support core instruction and meet accountability requirements. And to provide daily grade level planning time for all teachers. That means that the second grade team in a building has a common planning time together to figure out what they're teaching next, or look at student work, or data, etc. So maximizing core instructional time is a challenge. Over the past two years, we have shared, uh, we have, I think, bring me back from here with some time. We have shared in almost each POE presentation that we are looking at new ways to schedule our instructional time uh, within the start and end bells of the school day. And this is true actually in K-12. It's not just an elementary conversation, it's just that we're ready with elementary right now. To accomplish this, we join our Westchester colleagues, and the consortium is every district in the Westchester region, some Putnam districts as well, in working with an internationally respected scheduling consultant. During the course of our two years in large group and in individual consultations, uh, Dr. Reddy came to visit us in the district, and we had uh, private sessions with him uh, out at OCS this week, uh, December, I think it was. Um, Dr. Reddick presented us with a variety of options, I think more than we could probably explain here, of ways that we could regain some uninterrupted instructional time for classroom teachers. While every single idea that he presented is in existence and used somewhere in the United States, our job, the four of us, and then with guidance from Joe and our cabinet uh, colleagues, was to find the one that would work the best in our school district and be most acceptable and probably least disruptive. We believe, after a lot of conversation and a lot of nights looking at way different ways to do this, that the six-day schedule will accomplish the goals that we've set out and provide the least amount of change to the existing schedule norms. Many of us have worked with this schedule in other districts in prior career paths. So the current school day, presently our K-5 students have a six-hour school day. If we convert this to 360 minutes, here's a short breakdown of what that day looks like. We have either 40 or 80 minutes for a special, because right now there are sometimes two specials in a day. 45 minutes for lunch and recess, five minutes for passing time, times the four to six occasions that students are going to or from their classroom to lunch, to one special, possibly to two specials. So the remaining time when you subtract that out is approximately 3.4 hours if it's a one-day special, or four, I'm sorry, reverse that, 3.4 hours if it's a two-day special, 4.3 hours if it's a one-day special. That's what's left for the teaching of math, reading, and writing. We typically have, across the three schools, a 90-minute block for reading. Some districts do 120 minutes. 
45 to 60 minutes for writing, depending on the grade level, and approximately 75 minutes for math instruction. That's 3.75 hours. If you look back at that 3.4 number, you can see that on days where we have two specials in one day, we are over the time limit. So something gets crunched. You can also see that science and social studies is nowhere to be found on that list of subjects. Oh, I had to do So, um, we are painfully aware that we need to figure out ways to do more with less. And that tends the conversation around scheduling. So this is a visual of the week. The current five-day week, a typical student might have two specials on a Monday and then one special each of the subsequent days. The move to the six-day week stops having us refer to the days as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and now refers to them as day one, day two. For those of you who have children in the secondary level, you're familiar with A and B day and the flip at Blue Mountain from one and nine to nine and one. So again, they are looking, they have already done some of this work. It's very common in a secondary model. So in the six-day model, we go back to one prep period each day. Comparing five-day and six-day minutes, and we used the current school year, 16-17, as the baseline year. So in a typical five-day schedule, the average minutes for each special was 34 occurrences times 40 minutes meant that I had 1,360 minutes of art over the school year. In a six-day schedule, the average minutes for each special would be 29 potential occurrences times a 42-minute period, giving me 1,218 minutes over the school year. There's a 142-minute difference, which is approximately over the course of a school year, three classes of art, three classes of library, and six classes of either music or PE, both of which we have twice in a cycle. In re post their schedule in the classroom and it actually becomes part of a learning routine and morning meeting for the little ones. Um, it doesn't really take very long for kids to know what they're expecting to have on a given day. Of course, if, you know, when the change is made, that support will be increased by classroom teachers, probably for our own benefit as well as for the students. And we'll talk a little bit later on in the presentation about how we'll help support the parents with that as well. So there's no development age where it makes a difference. You know, the kids can pick it up. Yep. Kids, the little kids, are, kids are very adaptable. Uh, teachers do the extra work and providing it for them. There's no kindergarten or if they day two or day, day six or whatever, is going to know for sure that that's their day. Right. Without a teacher either posting the schedule for the week or writing the outside and they have to do whatever. Or mm -hmm. saying this is what we need. Right. Little, little, little kids. I mean, I'm sure it's just Craig who's got some trouble, you know, at the beginning. I'm sure as they transition to Blue Mountain, you know, the one and nine flip, and then next week it's nine and one, and it's like, what day is it? I have trouble when I visit with them, and we flip the weeks and figuring out what period I'm supposed to be in. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. So the benefits of a six. Oh wait, I want to go back because we didn't finish that bottom. So there's, an, I, I said that there's a difference of 142 minutes over the course of the school year. In return for that reduction, we gain 1,360 minutes of instructional time, or approximately four days of instructional time back for classroom teachers that can now get to social studies and science, perhaps have an extended writing period more than once or twice a week, et cetera. Okay. Benefits of the six-day schedule. It allows for only one special to occur in each school day, thereby increasing instructional time. It provides consistency for special area classes, which are no longer tied to a day of the week, 
but moves with the rotation. So if I have specials on Monday, go back to that five-day schedule, and I'm a little child that has two uh, specials on a Monday, I lose about, what do we figure, 15, 20 days over the course of the year because of holidays and half days and all kinds of things that interfere. Monday's a big day, and Friday is a big day. More occurrences with Monday than Friday. So the reduction hits a teacher, by the way, when we all just had an experience meeting with teachers who said, I haven't seen this class in five weeks. I don't know that I'm not going to finish this unit of instruction with this particular group of kids because this day that I have them for special is the day that we keep having things happen. And other things happen during the course of the school year as well, in addition to planned holidays. As you, you know, when you look at the calendar for next year, you'll see already marked the days that we know we don't have school or we have half days. But then there are, you know, field trips and assemblies and uh, concerts where we have rehearsal time and all sorts of things that sometimes take away unintentedly. Mother Nature likes to play games with us every now and then. So all of those things um, become unintended circumstances for instruction. Please. Another um, group of us to, of students for us to pay attention to when we look at a five-day, six-day schedule are students who uh, have related services, students who receive OT, PT, speech, uh, reading, counseling, so on and so forth. Um, I had a conversation today with, with an individual who said she hasn't seen her uh, speech group, or there was a time she didn't see her speech group for seven sessions in a row. And what that does is that creates a different conversation with Lynn and her team when it's time to do annual reviews, whether or not students met goals, what the prescription is for students uh, in the future years. So while we're talking about the specials, because those are uh, the occurrences students have outside of the regular instructional Experience. We're also talking about 13, 12 to 13% of our students uh, with IEPs and even more that, that have related services that um, this figure does not account for, but would help uh, provide additional uh, contact time. Would it be rotating also, or just that there's Likely both. Uh, right now, the way that IEPs are written are it's a uh, it's, uh, frequency, number of minutes per week. And we're having conversations with Lynn and our region, proceeds and our regional and state ed folks uh, to see how other schools in the six day rotation have done it. If it's uh, 30 minutes once a week for 30 minutes, um, can we extrapolate that out over a course of a year and provide more minutes within the six day rotation over the course of the year? So if, uh, again, if I have a Monday afternoon uh, reading class and we miss 12 Monday afternoons a year, uh, how can we put those students on a rotating schedule? It's a little bit of IEP work, uh, but it's doable. So is speech and OT and PT still included in the six-day schedule as well? I will defer to my colleague at the PPS. <laughs> First of all, Operator made a great comment about the fact that 
you know, um, we want to make sure that we're meeting the students' needs and, and providing the sessions for the students. But th this will ensure that we, we do follow that rotation and we do provide the service. I just have, just, so I could be clear in my mind. So the child is, is sort of on their IEP to receive, let's say, two days a week of speech, mm -hmm. and that speech falls on a Monday when we're off. That child will then move to Tuesday and yes. receive the speech on Tuesday. Yeah, correct. And so whatever. So that's what we mean about the consistency piece, because right now if school is closed Tuesday for a snowstorm, whatever was supposed to happen Tuesday is right. too late. Um, we are on to Wednesday. In the rotational schedule, Tuesday becomes Wednesday, and you keep moving forward that way. So it does allow for people who would normally have taken the hit with the lost day to just have the services the next day. So essentially, the child, instead of having it Tuesdays and Thursdays, he's going to have it day two and day four. Right, it's not, right. It's not so tied to that right. So if they're supposed to get, and I'm just curious, if they're supposed to get, you know, X amount of services on week, will you just, just work okay. closer with the teacher to figure out the schedule because if the child also has music right. during that time when they're moving up their speech, right. then that has to be more but it's coordination. Not that stage, no, we it's still don't have music on day one. No. And then <laughs> on day Barbara, one. you're talking yeah. about at what time? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yes. just, I'm yes. just saying That's it's going to take yeah. more planning time for the teacher. No, it will. It has to. Well, that is the ESL kids. ESL is like a I yeah. ESL is like AIS reading. So there there is a set schedule that's established. It will also be tied to the one, two, three, four, five, six. They mostly see their teachers every day. So that's there's less concern there. For the kids who are a little bit more advanced where they aren't in everyday services, they will make that work in the six day rotation, absolutely. Okay. Um, so again, providing consistency for special area classes which are no longer tied to the day of the week. So if I'm the Monday special, I start my year knowing already that I have less uh, exposure to my students than the children that I'll see on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Um, it also allows, um, in addition to the moving to one special during the course of the day for a classroom teacher, that means that I have longer blocks of time because my kids are not going in and out of my classroom multiple times during the day. Instruction, especially at the elementary level in probably the past 20 years, has really moved to long blocks of time. You saw the minutes that I put up for reading at 90, math at 75, uh, writing 45 to 60, depending upon the age of the student. So instruction is not in 15 minute spurts. It's, we want kids to, to linger in a topic and get deep with it. And during that period of time, kids are experiencing instruction in a lot of different ways, in different size groupings, sometimes working with different kids during that same time period, and working on different activities connected to a central aspect. So, you know, you sometimes just as the good stuff starts to happen, the bell rings, or oops, we have to go to the gym. Um, what we want is to be able to really talk about a book or uh, wrangle with a math problem and try to find multiple ways to solve it or wrestle with a social studies question or lots of times in social studies try simulations so what did it feel like to be a pilgrim and over there are the Native Americans and how do I make peace with them and still establish boundaries it's lots of interesting explorations that you can't um, engage in if you have short spurts of instructional time that's the only thing to your advantage there Okay, um, so elementary instruction, and I started to talk about that already. Elementary instruction is the building block to 612 success. I'm an elementary teacher by trade. In almost every school district, the high school is the jewel in the crown of that district. I will tell you that as an elementary teacher, I know firsthand that if we don't get the job done at K-5, 
There is a success that's coming at 612. So we are a critical piece of what comes after us. You go talk to the wonderful teachers at Blue Mountain. They will tell us, we need you to pick up on this. We need you to get a little deeper on that. So we know that we are the foundation to this building that we're trying to establish for our kids. So here's where we need time to focus on foundational skills in reading, writing, math, word study, and again, content that always gets pushed to the side. Remediation becomes increasingly challenging as students move through the system. There's lots of research that says if you can't catch a kid up by grade three, they're probably never going to get caught up. That's a sad statement to me. So we are deeply committed to doing what we have to do at the elementary level so that we're making sure we're sending kids to Blue Mountain in very good shape. Teaching and learning requires more and longer blocks of time for teachers to deliver instruction. It allows for time for group and independent practice and even one-to-one -one coaching. So a teacher might just pull a chair up next to Matthew and say, how's that book going, Matthew? Or how's that piece of writing? How, what can I help you with? Supports for the change. So preparing a one through six day schedule for the 17-18 school year with known holidays, etc. Um, we've we already have that in our head that we'll put that out there. We'll put it out through the elementary schools. We'll put it on our website. Uh, we will be updating the day changes. So, you know, we have a snow day. We'll make sure that it gets updated on the web page. We'll make sure that when we do have snow announcements, that the announcement will say for K-5 tomorrow will be C day or three day, however we go with this. Much the way you see secondary schools will remind their students and their parents that tomorrow is a B day. So we want to be able to help you with that. In the beginning, there will be confusion, absolutely. We'll give you something that says, your yellow days are speaker days, your red days are book days, bring your library books back. And we know in the beginning that we will have to remind one another. What day is it today? You know, we'll put signs in the front of the school. Today is a C day. When I walk into Blue Mountain, it says, today is it A day one and nine. Today is it a B day nine and one. Um, so we want to continue that support for people uh, so that everybody's on the same page as we continue through the changes for next year. So implementation. An elementary scheduling committee will be convened to monitor the implementation of the new six-day schedule. Their job will be to gather feedback, um, to look forward to other scheduling opportunities, and to think through uh, what possible changes we could make to the schedule that we create. As I said, there, there were literally so many potential opportunities available to us, so many different ways to look at the schedule. Um, it was intriguing that this gentleman's mind could work that fast. Uh, but we took what we thought was the easiest change to make, the ch change that people could be most comfortable with, uh, and a change that a lot of our colleagues in the Westchester and Putnam regions, and I know, I think Donna was up maybe in Orange or Duchess when you were doing this, so it, a six-day schedule is extremely popular at the elementary level because we're trying to spread specials and get maximum instructional time. It doesn't mean that at some point in time, we might not look to add a new special and then maybe rethink how we do this. There are lots of opportunities for our kids that we are eager to bring to the district, uh, and so that will be part of the elementary um, scheduling thing. So that is our conversation. Questions? Sure. Um, a long time ago, I did a lot of reading on resilience. And one of the findings of one of the first person resilience is the ability to overcome adversity. And um, reading, to your point about third grade reading or mediation, one of the markers for resilience is reading on grade level by third grade or fourth grade. Uh, many studies have gone there. So the getting kids to read on grade level by third and fourth grade is, is one of the absolute prime objectives that we need to do. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in there. It's, it's absolutely imperative that we get kids to read at grade level. I think a lot of the other things, I can remember years ago, when we first started talking about uh, incorporating literacy, and people were saying, well, they can't do that in PE, they can't do that in art, they can't do that here. And now I see these great lesson plans where, where uh, we have literacy in all of our programs. Absolutely. 
And so, you know, we can work these things together. Yes. Uh, and and I, I have a child who was pulled a lot. And he was, well, I'm not supposed to point gender, but I have a child who was pulled a lot. <laughs> and it got to where he was quite happy doing that. He liked to be pulled out of the class. You know, he could go here, there, and there. But he missed a lot of basic construction. Mm -hmm. And when you miss that basic construction, you don't get it back. It's, it's never, there's no other place to learn it other than in the classroom with your teacher. Mm -hmm. So if you can limit how many times kids are pulled, it makes a big difference in what the basic background knowledge that they get is. Yes. We have looked more and more at the opportunity for pushing instruction in both ENL and AIS reading. Um, because it's very true that you know, it's more challenging sometimes for kids who have to come back and figure out what they missed, and extremely challenging for teachers whose kids are leaving and then coming back in and the teacher is thinking, how am I going to make up that math lesson? I don't have any time left in the day to do that, but my obligation is to make sure that they understand what happened while they were here. So, you know, there are pullouts for many reasons. Um, and that's part of what I think that the, the uh, elementary scheduling committee can wrestle with a little bit more in phase two, so to speak. Yep. Now, using these classes in art and PE in particular, are we going to be able to maintain requirements for the state? There are no requirements for specials at the elementary level with the exception of physical education. And actually, the requirement for physical education, we do not meet the mandate for. It's about, I think it's 150 for K2 and 180 for uh, 3.5, and we don't come close to that. So that was the very first conversation that we had. And we did promise our PE staff that we would not forget that and go back into the conversation as we go through the year to figure out some creative ways that we can address those needs. But there's, there's no plans, please tell me, to cut any of the other specials no. in order to make up for that. Not at the moment. I think the whole community will be extremely mm -hmm. so not, 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 yeah. not at the moment. No. I'm with you. <laughs> So no, we have we we are what we are, and that's where we are. And we have we know we're not meeting that mandate for PE, and that's a conversation to continue. struggling with, um, and I shared this at the Frank G. Lindsay meeting the other night, I, there's this concept of core and everything else. And I think that we have holistic education. And I think that we see some of the best learning happening not in core. We see it when kids are applying it in, in whatever they're doing. And so I just encourage our district to really think harder. I, I get this whole bit about putting more time in the classroom. But you know what? We learn through different forums and mediums, and, and I know you all know that, you're educational professionals. But I mean, more time for a kid who's struggling with reading to sit there and reading, and I, I know we're talking about different types of activities, but you know what? Let's put the reading in the music room, okay? Maybe a kid's gonna be more interested about reading about an instrument or something, right? 
let's let's take um, you know in gym, and I've seen it with Mr. Kislin sure at, at BV. You know, taking math and putting it into phys ed, we can learn through other mediums, and I, and I think that's what I'm going to encourage you that just to. I get the whole A, A through F days. I, I, I start to appreciate that because I do appreciate it for the middle school uh, and, and, and even in the high school. But I just feel that, you know, to hear, hey, we don't even have social studies up there or science. You know what? You can learn social studies in music. You can learn science in art. You can learn math in art, right? Geometry. So I just encourage us to think a little bit beyond this core. Uh, and don't fall prey to that. The other thing is, um, I think you've heard me say it, social media, whatever, this is a two-year study. I understand there's been discussions at the Board of Ed about finding time, uh, but there's a lot of information that none of us have known. And to present it in June for something to be implemented in September, I'm glad the principals have been involved, but you know what? Shame on us, all right? We did the same thing with the library program, okay? You, you heard about it, our librarian who retired, okay, she had her role and responsibilities changed. That was delivered to people right before the school year started. So again, we have to stop doing this. You know, we've got active parents, we've got creative parents, we want to work in solution. We want to be supportive. We don't want to, you know, push back on you. We really don't. Um, but, but Two years and, and nobody knows about it, that I should shame on that. The other thing is there was an emotional welfare study, and Lynn might help me with this one, um, that I know that the district was looking at. The emotional welfare of our children, and I may be calling it the wrong thing, but it was about the anxiety, it was about the needs of our, the social and emotional, thank you. Uh, my question is, how does that tie into this? And are we taking the learnings from that study and applying it to here because we're going to have more stressful kids, right? We've got stressful kids preparing for the test. Well, hello, 90 minutes, 100 minutes, whatever we're going to spend on reading, we're going to have more stressful kids. So I hope that we're taking the benefit of that and, and applying it. Um, the last thing is, um, I did ask questions about the services the other night as well. I'm not sure I still get it. Personally, um, that kid's still going to get pulled, Charles. I don't think there's really any impact. I mean, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that, but I don't see a change there. I think they're still going to get pulled. Um, I do like the idea of more push-in. Um, you know, some of the best things I've seen, Mr. Laval, who's retiring, um, those inclusion classes, everybody benefits from those extra special services. So again, I think push-in, I love it. Um, years ago, Horizons program used to push in for everybody, not just pull out. Um, again, we all learn through different styles. So thank you. Um, that's just all my feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Is it possible to see Dr. Retting's report? I think that's the name I couldn't really see. Dr. Retting has a website which uh, I think is scheduling associates for. So you, so you said you consulted him, but you just consulted his website? Or? I, I think I said that we met with him in district, we met with him at OCs individually, and then the entire region worked with him on our schedules. Okay. So there are minutes from that or a report no, from that? No, there are no minutes from that. There were individual meetings. And so our notes were whatever our notes were. We shared files with us that we looked at to pick different options, both as a district and as the Western District. So every district had the same kind of experience, individual and group. It's, um, it's a shame that we can't see that because it would be nice to be to see that. I, you, you can go to his website and see lots of his ideas, absolutely, and all of those ideas are some of the things he presented to all of us. That's, okay, I will I will do that. It seems to like a certain professional, because we're talking about having done a study for two years, but actually it's a website, and a few consultations without notes or minutes. So it would be great to see that, uh, but I will go to the website. It also seems that we're conflating the um, OT and physical therapy and the specialist. From what I understand, I'm no expert, it seems that the, the requirements of the IEP will 
dictate that a child who requires 30 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever will continue to get that, irrespective of whether or not we have a five or a six day schedule for the specials. Conflating the two is misleading. That's not a benefit, we're overstating a benefit of moving to a six day schedule. In my well, if I was like right Let me answer a little bit. Um, when we looked at our current 16, 17 schedule, we looked at snow days, holidays, uh, late arrival, early dismissal, so on and so forth. Uh, if you were a student that had a special on a Monday, depending on what time you had it on a Monday, you lost almost 30% of the instructional opportunity in the same students who had the same class on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That's not just art, music, and phys ed or library, that also could be students who have some related services. If the schedule that Lynn said was uh, the agreement is with the classroom teacher on Monday afternoon from 1.45 to 2.30 before dismissal, and if we had a series of Monday afternoons of no school, we're stressed to try to, to, try to schedule that child at another point in the day or in the week when the people who provide those related services are already fully subscribed with other children. Okay. So um, it's, it's not just the, con the content of art, music, library, and phys ed, it's also students that have received special, um, receive other services outside of the classroom. On Fridays, it was almost 15% with, um, uh, you, you name it, early dismissal, snow, uh, late arrival, so on and so forth, depending on what time in the day you had your educational experience on a Friday, it was almost 15 percent. So those related services are attached to a particular day in our current schedule. So if there's no school that day, or we go home early or come in late, those services are not always guaranteed to be um, to, to, to be made up because of schedule constraints the rest of the week. To get that, I think, I think I get it, but moving to a six-day schedule with the specials doesn't, the, the two are separate. You're conflating two things which should work independently of each other. The specials with specials, and then any services should happen irrespective of the specials. You do. I do. Yeah. Th that is exactly what we're saying. We're just saying okay. that they both benefit from the six-day schedule. Okay, but the way that it was stated was if we move to a six-day schedule for the specials, we also benefit in these other areas. We do. I don't think. But you well, do, you do. Okay. because if a teacher cannot, you know, get to a particular class, yeah. if, what I believe is, mm -hmm. is the explanation, then that particular class will be held the following day. If a teacher cannot take her two or three children in speech, then that group will also move to the following day. Where before, it may yeah. be a scramble, or it may be that the child never got to see. I guess my I point is, don't why aren't we doing that already for those people who are getting services? I don't see how that is linked to the specials. They should still so like there should be several things running. If they, if they, just for example, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, if day two, you have um, gym at 10 o'clock and you have your you know your your OT at two o'clock on, on day two. Yeah. If we have to study that day, day two becomes it's just no, not that. So but totally I mean, got that. If, but I mean you're you're just you don't need to shift, you know, to get your 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 extra service in around, you know, what is now hard instead, you know, at two or twelve o'clock as opposed to, you know, there won't be that conflict anymore because each day will stay the same. Okay. The schedule. Things don't move. Right now, nothing moves. Yeah, right now, nothing moves. Yeah. Your day is service is canceled. Because the next day, I have a whole So why do we do that then? If the kids have an IEP with a requirement. Well, because I have five other kids the next day. So okay. somebody has to go. But I will tell I'm you. I'm still that. missing a part of it. But I will tell you that if the students, if we don't have school that day, we don't provide the service that day, but our related service providers are trying to get to the kids to make up that session yeah. at some point. That's they're, what they're, they're scrambling to try to make up those sessions so that the kid does get the service. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But if I, uh, okay, but we'll move on from that, but I, I will, because that doesn't make sense to me, it still doesn't make sense. I understand picking up where we left off, but the two are unrelated. If you have the schedule and the schedule, they're both six-day schedules. 
then when it shifts, it shifts. Because right. if you have a kid who has <coughs> every other week appointment with an OT, and it's on Wednesday, mm -hmm. we have them have a Everybody's using snow days for a holiday, and then two weeks later you have a snow day, and two weeks later you have another holiday. You can go. Yeah, uh, a month. I said more than that. that was cool. You yeah. should have because the IEP requires it. So yeah. but it, no, you should have. But, this, this but sometimes that doesn't happen it's, because it's not possible in a very tight schedule to make that up. We have an elementary principal back there who could point out some of those instances. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you should have gone <laughs> I'll think more about that. Okay. Um, and then my final question is uh, related to the number of minutes that you stated that you said um, I think it was 142 minutes would be lost over three classes for Art and Library. You didn't state the number of minutes for six classes of uh, P and Music, but I guess you double that. Two hundred and eighty-two minutes. Times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. That kind of leads into my next question, which is, how will this ultimately affect staffing? Because it seems to me that if you're teaching less minutes, you will ultimately need less staff. No, we have, no okay. staff member has lost any time in their position. Um, we have been able to reallocate, so we've been able to give a full-time library back in middle school because we're spreading the week. So we have teachers, uh, especially our teachers, who are now able to cover more classes And do you publish that information? That should be, I like, guess, It's public part public. of the building schedule, so it's part of your child's schedule, and it's part of the special area teacher schedule. But so that we can see, so that you can put our minds at rest, I would think that you would want to show us that information if we ask for it. So how does, how can you guarantee what that the teacher won't be so job? But, well, what, this is what I'm thinking of. So <laughs> I'm thinking that what will ultimately happen, because both my children are in middle school, what will ultimately happen is, someone who retires won't be replaced. And that will affect my children in middle school because as far as I'm aware, the next music teacher to retire is Mrs. Richter. And then there will be no band instructor in the middle school. Well, so I'm thinking as a I want to know that you are That's, 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 that's a really large leap of assumption that any staffing, any staffing that takes place, whether we're increasing staff or decreasing staff, is a conversation and, 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 and an act of support. This is not a there is no conspiracy here to in a year from now or three years from now or so on. I would like to believe that this is being his promise for two years. So I'm asking the question now, hopefully two years ahead of any change. You have to understand how the way that this has come out is leading us to ask questions that perhaps we wouldn't have asked otherwise. It's a, it's a fair question. I'm just, I want to answer it very directly that any change in staffing, whether we increase staff or decrease staff, is an act of the board based on a recommendation from the administration and, and forecasting potential retirement, so on and so forth, we don't envision that. Not, with a, not without a major change uh, in program, which is not on anyone's radar or interest. And keep in mind, there's informational nights, like Lauren said, there's, unfortunately, I'm going to be a little bit of a meeting right now. This is more for statements instead of a back and forth, right? We yeah. have information sessions for that, because that can, I know I'm being mean right now, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. So there are those nights where you can get in and ask those questions, right? And there's June 12th, there's two more at BB, and even if you're not going to BB, come to BB and ask, really ask the questions. The other both these programs that we use, like the summer programs, and the, um, we, we, we've used many other both these programs to do studies of this nature. Yeah, the, the study was a, a number of districts for a good long time have been um, struggling with time. The conversation regionally was born out of uh, many sleep studies and start school later from almost half a decade ago and this board has talked about it, realized at the time, you know, maybe maybe we're not ready to do it. And I'll tell you one uh, one good piece of data is Mary Pat and I went to uh, Furnace Woods and did sort of a info night to gain insight about moving the Furnace Woods bell schedule back to be in line with the two other elementary schools so we could more efficiently change staff. And we learned very quickly the impact that the potential impact that could have on children and families. 
So scheduling, time, sleep studies have been on this uh, region's radar for a long time. So what a lot of districts do is they come together and work with BOCES to say, we have these interests that, that we would like to study. We would like to study uh, special education programs. We'd like to study the opportunity to build STEM programs. We want to study uh, more meaningful and engaging after school programs, enrichment, you name it. And one of the hot button issues uh, since I have been here for a little over four years has been time at the elementary level. And what BOCES can do is BOCES can shepherd a group of school districts and, and school principals and staff who are interested in it, identify a consultant at a fraction of the cost, and say, come and learn through a workshop model or a mini conference. And if you're interested in learning more, we'll bring the consultant back and you can do individual, the, 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 the consultant for whatever the topic is can do individual analysis. The analysis, um, that uh, we have done, and it's not a study or a report, and, and I want to make sure we use the right words, and, and we had this conversation earlier this week at, at Frank G. and Furnace Woods, was we sent our employment contracts, uh, our teacher's contract, our support staff contract, we sent our bus schedules, uh, we sent the time uh, of the bell schedule for the three elementary schools and said, help us. Help us find efficiencies, help us find time. What are we not seeing because we have lived in this for decades and we just we can't see the forest through the trees? Um, it, included, uh, it included topics of how do we share staff more efficiently? Every time a teacher moves, we lose, uh, every time a teacher moves from building to building during the day, we lose almost two hours of instruction. And at one point, I came to the board and said, we have a group of teachers who are moving during the day and we were spending the equivalent of $188,000 of time in teachers moving during the day. We needed help to figure out how could we do this more efficiently. So it's a very natural progression of how uh, districts can go an inch wide and a mile deep in certain areas um, to receive individual consultation. And some of the individual consultation we, uh, we received was the, the, the consultant said, well, you, you offer two musics and I'm going to say some things here, and I said it to the crowd before who, who heard me earlier. You offer two musics in the elementary school. Do, do you know the New York State regulations say you only have to have one? Yes, but that's a value of our community, it's a value uh, in our culture, and that's the way it's going to be. Okay, tell me about music lessons. Uh, they take place during the school day, it's a pull out model. Okay, do you know you don't have to do that? Yep, but it's a value, it's culture, we don't want to change. Uh, another question is about rehearsal groups, our, our uh, orchestra and band, when do they rehearse? Do they rehearse before school, during school, after school? Do they rehearse during school, or teachers travel? So, I mean, you, you see where I'm going. The other issue we have that... Packing that, a lot in. Packing a lot in. The other issue that we learn, and this is not a secret, uh, is that we are um, under-educating in terms of minutes per week of students in physical education. And that has been a, one of the worst kept secrets in any elementary school in New York City. At one point, I think there were either nine elementary schools or 90% of elementary schools met the mandate. In order for us to meet the mandate, we would need to hire about two more teachers and we would have a space issue because we wouldn't be able to rotate all the kids through for the minimum uh, number of minutes per week. And what we don't want to have is a conversation about trade-offs. And as we talk about time, as we talk about how to use time wisely, unfortunately, the factions are created to say, you're oversubscribed to music, it's not what Carpenter does, Garrison does, you name it does, and you're undersubscribed in phys ed, you can solve the problem by trading in two music for two phys ed and get yourself in line with the state ranks. Those are conversations that we had with the consultant at Margaret Life with three elementary principals. And some of the things we do, uh, we have done for a long time because that's what this community values. And I had said that at, at the meetings earlier this week. Uh, I had a conversation with a parent from Frank G who, who Garrison went to a six-day schedule. They offer two arts during the six-day rotation. They offer two arts, they don't offer two music. Um, another school buses kids in before school or after school for rehearsals. School
schools do it differently. Some meet the mandate, some don't, some exceed it. It doesn't matter. It's what, it's what your community values, and this is what we value. Those are the conversations with the consultant that may get very specific and unique to our history, our current reality, and, and, and the direction that we want. It's a long answer. I hope that there are two other studies that I know of that we've done over the last nine years. We've done two bus transportation studies through both of these, I believe both of them. And, and also uh, one about sports scheduling. You're in the midst of a great recession, we cut games. And we cut, we changed the yeah. geography of the groups that we were aligned with so we wouldn't have to travel and spend so much money on travel. So there, there, there are many, BOCES is a group of 19 schools, and then there's Southern BOCES, which is 20-something schools. So it's a resource for us to use to do these different kinds of studies. So many schools have the same research. I'm sorry, you've been waiting. Oh, that's okay. Um, I was totally nervous, so that gave me time to forget about it. Just like a loud mouth, so you know, to be nervous when I'm talking and you know, being loud is a little ironic. I'm Michelle Piccolo Hill. Hello. Um, this is going to be a jumble of thoughts and statements because as you guys were going on, I was just writing things that were popping into mind. Um, I guess my first thing is I have four kids in the district. And what I find amazing is that each child is absolutely unique. They each have their own interests, they each have their own passions. They each study things in different ways. And my concern with this is that it's basically looking at the schedule and it's saying math, English, those are important. Art, music, PE, those are expendable. And from my perspective, I don't think they are. I think kids learn in different ways. I think for some kids, they need that art, they need that music, they need that PE as an outlet so they can focus on the, the literature or the math. And that's coming from someone whose children are good at literature and math. But they also thrive and, and live for at times those specials. And I think calling them specials is a fundamental problem because it's treating them like something that doesn't have to be there. And when you cut those things, you are looking at education like this. And you're saying, kids need to learn to read, they need to learn to do math. But a lot of kids are gonna go into careers that use music, that use rhythm, that use art, graphic designers, TV producers, I mean, all these things go into jobs that they will ultimately go into. So when you're cutting so many minutes, I guess, um, I don't know, it's one way, so. <laughs> I guess, you guys keep talking about how great it is that it's gonna be a rotating schedule. Because the classes on Monday are no longer gonna be the ones to suffer. But when you look at the numbers, you're bringing every day to a Monday. So your ra one of your rationales is that Mondays no longer suffer, but every single day is a Monday. So from my perspective, I'm looking at my kids and I'm going, you need that extra bonus in your day because it rejuvenates you. I mean, when, when we all work, when we do things, we don't go in and just put our nose to the grind from nine o'clock until five o'clock or eight o'clock or 10 o'clock. We have those moments where we take a moment to unwind and do things that we truly enjoy. And for some kids, the art and the music and the PE is what they truly enjoy and they need that. So to just go in and to tell us as parents, after a two-year study, which I also have a problem with, because if it is a study, it should be more than conversations. This is, from my perspective, a huge curriculum change. And to make this huge curriculum change, without the people that it affects the most, the parents who are watching our kids go through this, I think it's a problem. And I understand that the teachers need more instructional time. I, I'm a big advocate of school. We are huge believers in education. We are huge readers. We believe math is fundamental, but we don't look at it with blinders. And come to and to find out, 
and I know this all went about in, a, in an odd way, but to find out, oh yeah, they're cutting these things that make our district great. After we just got all these music awards, after seeing my kids develop these beautiful things in art, seeing my kindergartner be so excited and bring me notes that he drew every day, is very upsetting. And to find out that it's being implemented and that we really have no say is so upsetting, I can't even begin to, to tell you. I mean, I am telling you, so I guess I'll keep going on. Um, let's see. I also, one of my concerns is something that, you know, is an ongoing conversation throughout the district, which I know is being addressed, is enrichment and differentiation and all of those things. My concern is also, you know what, I think the teachers are great and I think they have a really hard job. It's something that I don't do and I think it's incredible that they take 20, 22, however many kids in their class and they teach these 22 kids or however many kids every single day and they need to be focused and they need to help kids with so many different needs. I mean, I'm four and that's hard. So I know they have a hard job, but I have seen time wasted in little ways so my concern is, we're talking about the kids that need to be caught up, but what about the kids that don't need to be caught up? What about the ones that are already wasting time while other kids in the class are being caught up? Is the additional instructional time going to be used in a great way for all the children? And, and the problem is, no one can tell you that. That's not something that you can say, yes, if 10 extra minutes are added to math, your child is going to be pulled out and given this, this, and this, because it's on an ad hoc basis. So I sit there going, okay, so my child's now going to sit in the classroom for an extra 10 minutes reading a book or waiting for the other kids to catch up instead of going to art or instead of going to music or instead of getting PE. So that's another concern of mine. I'm not concerned too much about whether my kids, um, you know, I have two in the middle school, whether my fourth grader and my kindergartner know it's an A, B, C, D, or E day. They're smart, they'll probably figure it out before I do. It doesn't really matter. The issue to me is more, I mean, I think we're focusing on that because it's just an easy thing to think about and answer. I think ultimately, the bigger concern is what they're losing by not having day A because it's the sixth day, so they miss it for a week. I think that's a bigger issue. Um, again, you know, I've spoken to some people who deal with a six-day schedule, and um, I think those districts have different school days, so they have a lengthier school day. Sometimes they also have more money, so they can supplement some of the losses by going to this six-day. And that's something that we might not be able to do. I know we have a lot of constraints, whether it's financial or it's time-wise. So to make such a fundamental shift and do such a big cut, because I know I've heard various numbers, um, numbers that you guys have run, and also numbers that other parents have run, and, and the difference is huge. The difference was, um, I think at one point, someone was bouncing around like 700, 800 minutes per year. And when you look at that, and you look across the board, how much construction they're using in these other elements, I think it's, it's enough to make us question this and see if there's another way. Again, um, you know, the thought of doing things like a music in motion or bringing math into a PE might be a way so that we're not losing that. Um, I mean, again, there's a lot of creative people here. And I think if we all put our minds together and have these conversations as a whole, instead of dictating something and putting something into, um, or you're enacting something before these conversations, because I know you guys have the conversations I believe that, but again, I haven't seen anything on paper, and I know the answer is, well, we had these conversations, but again, something that huge should be written down. Something that huge should be based on X, Y, and Z, not just a conversation with the district that's already doing it, because they're not going to tell you, yeah, it sucks, we were wrong. They're going to say, it's great, we love it, because if they say it's bad, then those parents are going to say, why did you do this if it's so, so bad? Um, another concern of mine is the emotional value behind these things, which I sort of addressed before, that some kids need that. So I think that emotional value is something that you would put into a study, because the study shouldn't just be about how many minutes you get in a day, but how this is ultimately going to affect the children. And they're, you know, they're yen for learning. So that's it. Thank you.
I want to respond to a couple of things. First, mm -hmm. Michelle, those were not comments from a nervous woman, so thank you. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was nervous, but I got over the uh, We had conversations, and I know it's an echo chamber for a lot of the, the folks who were at the, the first, any of the four meetings, but time, time is a big deal. And Margaret uh, walked us through the time we spend getting places, going back and forth. You know, do do we need ten minutes to get from uh, our reading classroom to our 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 uh, regular teacher classroom to grab a group of kids for a reading for a reading lesson? Mm -hmm. And some very simple things when we talk about time. Again, I apologize for for repeating. Uh, we don't start our music lesson program until October. And we have had conversations, very direct conversations with the music folks to say, we can do better. Mm -hmm. We can do, we can get kids in quicker, we can do better. Uh, the, the concerts that we have, this is concert season, uh, Frank G is tomorrow. Our teachers rotate across the three elementary schools, so when they're having a concert at Frank G, or Frank G, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Frank is doing his concert at BV, there's no instruction happening at that time. We can do better. We're talking about you know a, a potential three classes missed of music. Um, we can get ahead of a lot of these things and make up more than three classes of music. When we talk to uh, some of our, our special area teachers, and I don't mean special area teachers, but how, how can we recover some time to go quicker and go deeper with kids? There are a lot of ways. I, I'm still stuck on, and I hear what Michelle was saying about every day is a, is a Monday. We can do the math the other way. We can look at every child that had one or two specials uh, on, uh, on a Monday, whatever the high frequency day is, we can apply our snow day, so on and so forth. And when certain kids, or half of the kids in the school on, on a particular day are losing almost 30% instruction, when an art teacher comes to me and says, I've got classes that are eight sessions ahead of my others, I guess they don't get to experience certain things. We have to take all of those things into account. And uh, to fast forward about supporting the whole child, this district and this board has been in front of us. Some of our, um, some of our scheduling tweaks, I mentioned people who were moving and were trying to, to be more creative with scheduling a couple years ago, it actually created a full-time orchestra teacher at the high school that never happened. And that individual was able to create music electives that never existed at the high school, including AP Music Theory, guitar, and other performance groups. Uh, we're one of the only middle schools in the region with not only art electives, but the opportunity for kids to take music every single day in addition to a performing group. So th this, this shift in time that will, will not mitigate or eliminate student opportunities in middle school and high school, and I have to be super clear about that. But, but how it will we use how, their interests. How we use time within the school day has to be has to be addressed. We had an uh, individual; she's uh, with us today, who said something very popular at Frank G. Was kill all the parties, kill all the. Uh, oh, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Kids. I'm all for cupcakes. Yeah. So. What, I'm going, what I'm going to say <laughs> is, is the, passion, the passion around 142 minutes mm -hmm. in exchange for the potential of increased time in the classroom can be, uh, can be uh, uh, made up and, and can flip the other way with some very serious and focused conversations on how we use time in our schools. And I know Donna is here. Donna has done a phenomenal job making sure that when there are in-school assemblies or the authors come in through through the PTA, that she's flipping the schedule to make sure that the afternoon kids or the Monday kids or the Friday kids aren't affected. That's how we ended up with a flip schedule at the middle school a number of years ago. That they went one to nine. Uh, on a week and then nine to one to make sure that there was equity when there were uh, uh, late arrivals, early dismissals, you name it. No, I mean, I agree. I, I think, I guess another thought of mine is that, um, you know, because some of the numbers are being run with the thought of, well, you miss it when you go on a, on a trip, or you miss it when you have a concert, you miss it. No, we didn't count those. You didn't count those, so those weren't at all a factor in your timing. Okay. I mean, I guess, you know what, this was such a surprise to me, 
and ultimately I am looking at the numbers, I still don't quite understand the numbers because I don't understand how you can lose 142 minutes and gain 1,300 and something minutes. That to me doesn't make sense. So if some, you know. Well, certainly we, we met with uh, some other folks from uh, Frank G earlier today. We talked, we came to an understanding, we understood where everyone was. Right. We'll be more I mean, I think one of the numbers I have heard was like 700, 800 minutes of specials lost. So it's like of all the, the, the kinds. But, and so when I look at that, I think, because yes, you're right, the district is phenomenal with having the art classes in the high school and the music and all of that other stuff. But as a parent, it does concern me because it does look like it's a first step on a slippery slope. Right. It's very hard to bring this stuff back. You cut it, you don't get it back. You don't, because it's not that you're gonna suddenly find all this extra time so that if it didn't work, you're just gonna be- We're not cutting it. Anybody We're not cutting it. But see, you are cutting it. It's a loss of 700 minutes. It's a cut. It's a decrease. So the way the rotation works, if you have music on- Okay, if, if, if you are cutting 700 minutes of specials, you are cutting. Cut means decrease. It means you are losing that time in the specials. And I guess that's also one of my problems is the transparency. It is a loss. The kids are losing this special time. And I think ultimate, you know, I think we need to say what it is. I know they might be gaining other things. I, I would love to see something that would make me feel absolutely confident in the loss. I would love to see the balance you know, equal out so that I can say, okay, you're losing this, but you're gaining that. And right now we're just going on faith that it's gonna equal out. And it's such a huge loss that I need to go on a little more than faith. And I do think that it's the beginning of the slippery slope. I think this year it's, well, we lost that, that went well. You know what, we aren't meeting the mandate. We don't really need two music classes. There is a music class for elementary school. So, and I know you guys are shaking your heads, it's, it's very, very possible. It's actually probably very feasible. So that's why people are so concerned because this is step one. Next year we're going to be here saying, well, what do you mean you're taking away the music class? So, you know, no one's promising it was at this time we're not doing this. At this time is a very terrifying statement for a parent because at this time means it's very possible that it could happen down the road. But we're not going to, you know, we're not going to say it either way. We're not going to say, yes, it's going to happen. We're not going to say, no, it's going to happen. And as a parent, when I say, well, not right now, or maybe, you know, okay. <laughs> you know, so that is a very, very scary statement for a parent. So I understand that you all don't have the intention to cut music. It is very possible and probably probable at this point, because if you guys need to make the mandates for PE and you can't find time to even keep the specials and give more instructional time, the only thing on the schedule that can go is music, because you have two musics. And the mandate, you don't have to say the mandate is PE. So I guess my last comment is I just want the transparency. I want to know it is a decrease. The district knows it's a decrease. They are decreasing and taking away and they're taking away a significant amount of lessons in these specials, which I think should be considered part of the curriculum and not special, not something additive for the kids. And that this is potentially the first step, may, may not be the first step to having to decrease music to meet the state mandates of PE. Mm -hmm. So. Can I just redirect for a minute? Michelle, that was an excellent slide. Thank you. Um, I've heard Lauren and Michelle both say that maybe we could put more reading and art or more math and music and those kinds of things. I, for my kids anyway, I found there was art in their reading that they would draw a picture and then write about it. Mm -hmm. Or music in the math where they would listen to songs and try to you know, work out the beats or whatever. So there's almost cross-pollination and where the art class is more art technique, art theory, art... I, there might be more ways to integrate art and music into the math and English instruction that they're getting in the classroom. Correct. Right. Yes? Yeah. Um, I'm sure they do. Good evening, everybody. Rebecca Quigley. Uh, I have two children at Frank G. Lindsay Elementary School, and I'm the co-president of the PTA at Frank G. Lindsay. Um, uh, 
I just wanted to reiterate some of the things that I've heard in the various information sessions that I've attended this week. I did attend both of the sessions at Frank Juvenzi on Monday, um, and uh, Erica Mills, my co-president, and I, we met with Margaret and Joe this morning to express our concerns. I just want to share them with the board at large. Um, and I also just want to address the comment earlier about uh, the uh, tonight not being an informational session. Um, I just want to share that in the past 72 hours, there have been new developments. So tonight is kind of becoming an informational session, even though I know it's not intended to be. Um, for instance, um, on Monday night, Margaret announced at the Frank D. Lindsay meeting that there would be a committee happening um, next year. Um, so that's a new development. So there, this is spinning very quickly this week, which is, is great to see You know, really solid feedback already. Um, I just want to share that the PTA uh, has been approached by teachers in our building at Frank G um, that they're very worried about the loss of the 40 minute prep time um, with the curriculum being more rigorous. Um, I also have expressed to Joe and Margaret, I just want to go on public record as saying that the PR rollout of this um, has been very troubling and as Michelle just said, um, we want a lot more transparency. Um, earlier in the week it was being referred to as a study and now it's being referred to uh, as the fact that uh, it was just a series of meetings. Um, so, and, and then again tonight being told to look at a website. It's just a little disconcerting. Um, uh, also, the PTA has been very concerned, and I, I've personally been very concerned with the lack of numbers that we've seen about this. Um, uh, the numbers are the only way that the parents are going to be able to get their heads around this. Um, and uh, the fact that the PTA has done more cohesive numbers than I've seen in any presentation yet is, is also very troubling to me. Um, and my co-president Erica is going to speak about the numbers next. Um, uh, and uh, I also just want to say that uh, uh, in an earlier meeting this week, uh, Dr. Roller mentioned that there is going to be a committee formed, uh, and it will be con uh, con uh, convening next fall uh, to evaluate the plan B of this rollout. Uh, and uh, uh, I understand that there may possibly be a board member, there will definitely be principals involved and some uh, strata of teachers. I've heard maybe leadership committee teachers, um, and I would encourage there to be a parent uh, from every school on that committee as well, uh, based on the feedback that uh, all of the uh, administrators are hearing this week. Um, uh, and I'm, again, I'm thrilled that the committee is happening. Um, uh, I personally, I understand the, the six-day schedule. I understand the need for it. I understand why we have reached this point in our conversation. Um, and I, I can see where it would work and that it would, it would be really good for Hen Hud. But I have a, a lot of questions about how it's going to happen. And I don't want this to be a learning curve for our district. I want us to approach this thoughtfully and with transparency so that we can hit the ground running in September because we've been told at several meetings this week that this is happening in September, that this is a done deal. And it's disturbing that you know, we're hearing about this now. Um, I, I do think it can work, but I think that there need to be some really significant tweaks. Um, and I addressed this with uh, Joe and Morgan, and I, again, I'm just going on public record here. Um, uh, according to our numbers, there will be a significant drop in the specials. Uh, and uh, again, my colleague uh, Erica will speak about that. Um, uh, we have suggested that there be some modifications to the six-day schedule. Uh, we know for a fact that Briarcliff, I know they have a longer school day, but Briarcliff, uh, with their six-day schedule, when there are weeks without an elementary music or a, a week without an elementary art, that they compensate uh, for that. And they have kind of a floating, I, I'm not an educator, so uh, forgive the lack of terminology, but they have a drop-in period or a, a floating uh, time period where, it, you know, maybe the K-1-2 kids who are working in an art-based curriculum at the time, they can have that extra art that they missed that week. Or perhaps the older kids miss a lesson period, they can have uh, an extra lesson period. And I think there are tweaks that need to happen before this is implemented in September, and tweaks like this. And we've started some of these conversations with Joe and Margaret, and the PTA is grateful for your time this morning and all of this week. We have really appreciated the information sessions, um, and we've had good parent turnout at all of them. Um, and uh, I just uh, want there to be a lot more discussion. I would have loved to have seen the committee formed this past year in advance uh, of this, uh, you know, the news coming this spring. Um, and I, I think it's great that the committee will be formed in the fall, but it should have been happening, uh, you know, earlier this year. So uh, anyway, thank you for your time and attention to this tonight. I think it's really, really incredibly important. And you can see with all of us here tonight, you know, we're super passionate about it. So thank you.
morning, my name is Erica Mills. I am co-president of FGL PTA. I have a sixth grader at Blue Mountain and a third grader at FGL. Um, I just want to reinforce the number of minutes that are being lost publicly. If you take 142 and you multiply it by six, you get 852 total minutes on average lost for specials. That's a huge number. I projected, my number's actually going to be more than that, and i talking to Joe and Margaret this morning, I think that you know you kind of have to sit and wait and see how it works out when you actually sit in the classrooms. Um, I project it will be more, and I'm going to let you know that I will be keeping track of that myself because I think it's very important. Um, I think the committee will be a great asset um, when you start hearing from different people and pulling all different ideas together because I think that what K through three needs is a lot different than what four and five needs. Um, I know in four and five we have a lot of pull out time already based on music instruction. Um, you know, what does that extra 40 minutes in the classroom look like? What is that actually going to get us? I can tell you right now that my daughter's in third grade, they're doing phenomenal science and social studies work in that room based on rainforest and butterfly observations. My, they grew butterflies in the classroom. It's amazing. That's science and social studies. We're doing it. It's there. It's integrated in our ELA. It's integrated in our math. It's also in our music curriculum. It's also in our gym curriculum. I really feel that when my daughter has gym once a week, she's going to come home and say, Mommy, I only saw Mr. G one time this week. Mommy, I only had music one time this week. I only got to see Mrs. Corrales. Mommy, I didn't even get to see Mrs. Dini this week. This is going to come up with our children. We have to just be aware of it, listen to them, you know, see how this affects them. I have, I'm not an educator. Um, I'm passionate about education, but I'm not an educator. I have a feeling, um, and this is just the sense, that without that extra gym, there are going to be times when children are, when you're losing 20% of their gym, it's going to happen. They are going to be stressed. There's going to be behavioral things. It's going to come up. So I just hope that we compensate for that as we go forward and we start thinking about that. Because 852 minutes is a lot of minutes. To gain 1,300 in the classroom, you know, what's that really going to look like when we put the kids in the room? So just, just want to put that out. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Sabrina Sanchichi Carrera. I um, am a parent of two children, the one that is in third grade currently, and my daughter really is entering kindergarten in fall. I just have one question, and it's based upon new information. Um, when you were talking about the OT and the PT, um, and I know there's a little bit of confusion about understanding how it's going to work. So if it is, um, you actually, I'm just going to go with your way that I said that it was 20% less is what you said time-wise. That was what I wrote down what you guys said. Because of when you put it in uh, two times a week or three times a week or whatever it is within a five day and spread it out to six day, that was what one of you, somebody up here said, I don't know, 20% um, less. So my question is, you said you're gonna have to make it up. How would you make it up? Are you gonna make it up with the frequency and change it in the IEP? Or are you gonna lengthen the time of the pullout? That's what I said, 20%. That if you're doing it, that well, that's my question. Is, is how, what is going to change? Because to make that up, then you're, you have it five days, you have it six days. So what is going to happen? So if it's a pullout that's only thirty minutes now, are there going to be a pullout that turns out to be forty minutes? I, I'm, I'm asking really more from the teacher perspective, to be honest with you, because I'm thinking about what does that look like when we teach and the block scheduling of it. Um, that, that's just my question, and I know this is new, and I know this is something that everyone is working through. Um, but just, I guess, to punt it up as a conversation. Yeah, those are conversations we've been having, especially with, uh, I know it started with me and our superintendent colleagues of what the IEP document would reflect. Probably the schools move from a, from a Monday through Friday to a six-day schedule. There are a number of, of options. Some schools, and I'm not suggesting we will do this because it will go to, to the point you made, some schools define a week as a rotation. 
Um, our interest is making sure that over the course of a 180-day school year or, or a 40-week school year, that the minutes remain static, which means the frequency will that the, the frequency and the minutes per session would increase in a six-day schedule. To make sure that if if they're being seen, I'm just going to say something random. <laughs> if they're being seen right now for 500 minutes throughout the year currently. You're going to do whatever you need to do to make sure that they're going to be still seeing that 500 minutes. And so you're going to be looking at whether or not it's an additional time or whether or not you're making the duration longer. So we haven't decided which way that's going to exactly. go yet. Exactly. And then the child. Exactly. And it, and it goes back to if, if the child is scheduled on a, a Monday or Friday or a certain time on those days, or let's say Wednesday afternoon when we have a half day for Thanksgiving. Uh, or a half day next week or whatever day is right. at the elementary that those kids wouldn't miss that because of the way the schedule is. No, I completely yeah. understand. I, I, I think everybody understands how this will benefit all of all of the children in that way. I think, you know, everyone complains about having missed specials or anything like that. You know, half days, My I know the special in my classroom for second graders is at 145. So every half day, my kids don't get it. So that will stay status quo because <laughs> we'll say that's what we just don't have half days. Um, you still can have those things that miss. But I think we all understand how this will help the frequency of children and not having one day that misses more than the other. I just really want to know how you were looking at making it up. Whether it was frequency, increasing it if it was two times to three times a week, or if it was increasing the duration. Yep. Um, and then the other thing is I really am looking forward to the committee on this. And I know you jokingly said, would you be on the committee? You did. And I, I will, on camera, say I would gladly sit down and do it. Because I think scheduling is difficult. It's, it's a difficult conversation. And there are a lot of things that need to be looked at. And I think it, I think the committee will really be beneficial. And maybe we can find some out-of-the-box answers. Um, also, being the former enrichment teacher, I did the pushing program, and you know it was financially a different time period. But I will tell you, it was really wonderful. It was really, really wonderful, and it was not you didn't you didn't monopolize the teachers' time for the entire year. It was small units. I had some of your children from Mrs. Edmund and Ellie's kids. Um, it really was great, um, and it's a way to give everyone enrichment, and it can be. We talked about it at the end of my time doing it, talking about tying it into the curriculum and helping out the teachers with the social studies and the science, um, which can really be easily done. Um, I know, you know, we did, well this year in second grade, we did communities. We did the whole big thing on communities, our whole second grade work together. You know, that would be something that we could kick even further and you can take it into map drawing. And, and there's so much that you could do that even if you had the enrichment teacher could help you do that and fulfill that time. So I'm just throwing it out there because I think if it is a possibility, that would be something that would be beneficial to the students, to the teachers, to the parents. You would enrich all of the children. Um, you would have that 40 minutes that you're putting back into the classroom could be used in a way that all of the kids can be given something either that they need but can be kicked up a notch. Uh, it's just a thought to draw out that. Thank you. And multiple parents said, where's Crappens Band? Where's Crappens Band? So now we know. They don't have two music since elementary school. But it's a causal relationship. <laughs> we actually, Lauren, we actually went to the Honor Society induction last night. Mr. Hopwriter and I went, and that was one of the statements, is how wonderful it was that we had such a good music program. And they actually invited all of the elementary music teachers to participate in the induction ceremony because they said, you know, you started our students. And I have to tell you, as a former teacher who worked for a long time in Frenchie Lindsay, it was always one of the best parts of being there is having our wonderful special teachers. And I don't care.
care what you want to call them. They all know they're feeling they want to special. Yeah, it's special. Yeah. So, I'm on a special the other day, and I, I, for one, think, you know, it's a wonderful program. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Levine. Um, I have two children, a Frenchie, a fifth grader, and a first grader. Um, I have some questions about this. I know you have this lovely presentation, and I thank you for preparing that to educate us all about the six-day schedule, because I, like everyone else, thought, what? We're going to have school on Saturday? Um, so I was actually relieved to hear that wasn't the case. Some, no, but some, some, some were begging for it. So. No, no, no. The kids wanted school on Saturday. Um, but um, again, a report from all this study would be really helpful in understanding how you came to this. Um, you know, you're going from a 40 minute special to 42 minutes. How did you arrive at 42 minutes instead of 45 or 50? I understand part of this has to do with the teacher schedules and scheduling the day, but um, that was a question I had. Um, I had another question about um, what is going to be added to the classroom with these 1,300 minutes. Um, you know, we've talked about the potential for, well, are we going to lose that second day of music? And I think that's a valid question. Looking back on my older child's six years in the district, there have been a lot of losses. Um, you know, in kindergarten, she had two field trips. We don't have that anymore. We have one field trip. Um, then there was the 2% budget cut. A lot of other stuff went away. We lost Horizons for a while. We lost our librarian. We've got some of that back. And then there was the core, the common core. And suddenly there was no science or social studies in my child's school day. And we're wondering, why does my kid not know about the pilgrims? Why don't they know what the Civil War is? So I think that stuff is very important. And it's definitely um, so I would love to see more science and social studies in the curriculum. I have anything to say. Um, and I have another question about um, band. So one of my children is in band, and they have a music lesson once a week. So is band, is that lesson going to go to a six-day schedule too? Do we know the answer for that? I don't know that we've even... They're a separate so. entity. How they schedule their lessons has nothing to do with anything else about school. Okay. Yeah, so it's they, not like the, music, the general music class or the art, art special. The lessons are separate. Those lessons oh, okay. happen separately. Okay. Lessons are separate. That's not what this music is. Okay, so I'm not an educator. I don't know a lot about what's going on except for what I hear yeah, from my kids. And I'll just tell you one of the one of the tough things about the mechanics of, of the elementary music schedule with uh, regards to lessons. So we have an, orca an elementary orchestra teacher and band teacher that services the three schools, and they need to collaborate with the three elementary principals to see what days they'll be in the particular school whether they'll be there all day, part of the day, so on and so forth. And once that schedule gets set, then they schedule their lessons with the students who are in that school on those particular days. Okay. That's it here. Um, and um, so, somebody talked about transparency. Um, what other studies are going on? <laughs> <laughs> We've been public about uh, a lot of studies that we're going to have to undertake regarding entropy. Um, those will likely commence in the late summer. Um, the board's going to have a retreat for uh, quite a bit of time over the summer to uh, identify priorities with regards to entropy. I feel that there is a, a loss, that's my knee-jerk reaction with, with the, the six-day schedule, but I am also coming to understand that that is in a lot of ways an effort to retain the second day of music, because it would be easy to just say, 
proposed to the five-day schedule and just have one day. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rhonda Malhatra, and I have uh, one student at Blue Mountain. And first off, I just want to commend the district on all the things that we do well, because we do a lot of things that are terrific and great, and that needs to be acknowledged and needs to be recognized. Um, in the conversations of all of this, uh, I guess because we're having the conversation about the curriculum, um, one of the things that I've noticed with all of the schools that seem to have the six-day schedules is they have a health block for elementary. And I just uh, sent a note this morning to Joe and Margaret uh, regarding health at the elementary level. Um, I think we do a good job to educate our kids on drugs and alcohol. We do a good job on talking to them about bullying. Um, we do a good job on having you know, a special program at the middle school about sexting and all of these other things, but we're not teaching them the fundamentals that they need to know to understand what sexting is and all and the fact you know that we're teaching them that drugs and alcohol are gateways to other behaviors. We're not educating them what those behaviors are. So in the context of this conversation of looking at the curriculum, I would really like to open the conversation about our health curriculum. Um, I happened to take a look at uh, Scarsdale's website today. Our health curriculum on our website is a page. Scarsdale outlines everything, K through 12, step by step, everything that they're doing. And we aren't doing it. We're doing the bare minimum. And I think in this day and age, it's irresponsible to not be thinking about uh, starting the conversations about consent and sexuality and what that all means at a very early age. So I just wanted to go on record tonight to you know, say that I reached out about it um, and that I really hope that it's gonna be a topic of conversation going forward. Good evening. My name is Amy Gerard, and I just want to clarify um, statements are now being accepted for anything and everything under the sun. Okay, not just in reference to this schedule. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, my name is Amy Gerard, and I have two kids uh, in the district one at Furnace Woods and uh, one in Blue Mountain, a sixth grader. And at the beginning of the year, my husband and I learned that our, in our sixth, sixth grader social studies class, the new textbook that Hen Hud chose does not include Islam under the world religions per the Common Core Standards Guide. I reached out to the teacher, and she assured me that she would be covering Islam at the end of the year with other material she has put together. I've contacted the publisher of TCI, and they said that Islam is covered in the textbook titled Medieval World that was developed for some graders. My concerns are, in the process of choosing a new textbook for social studies, the district should have chosen a textbook for sixth grade that covered all the world religions as the common core standards require. I give the teacher credit for making an accommodation and doing extra work to gather other additional material, do other research, and to develop other lesson plans as a result, the district has placed the teacher in a position where Islam is otherized. This othering can have a negative impact given the political and social climate we live in. The current US administration has tried to enact two travel bans targeting six Muslim majority countries. There has been a 67% increase in hate crimes targeting Muslims in the United States as well as terrible attacks by derailed and mentally ill individuals who identify themselves as Muslims. Based on some preliminary research, both Lakeland and Yorktown school districts use textbooks for their sixth grade social studies that cover Islam as part of the world religions. I can provide you with information about those textbooks. The board's mission for the Hen 
Unified School District includes the following. An educational environment that is challenging, creative, exploratory, accessible, and nurturing, and a fully engaged, supportive community. Therefore, the least that we would expect from the board is that they choose a textbook that covers Islam in Comparative World Religions Unit, and in doing so, fulfills their mission.
Corey's heard this before, Barbara's heard this before. I've been elected three times as a board member. And I opposed every time. The first time I was elected, Roseanne gave us the stat sheet, and my son was dancing around saying, you won, Dad, you had the most votes, you won, you won, you won. My wife, wise woman that she is, looked at us and Charles, I thought you were running unopposed. I said, I am. She said, who are the 500 and something people who voted against you? <laughs> so that was a hard lesson that some people just aren't going to agree with us and they're going to vote no against the school district's budget. It's a hard lesson. Another hard lesson I had as a board member, when we tried in 2011 to raise the bond uh, to put forward, and I take a lot of it on myself because I was very enthusiastic. We'd gone out and, read and found somebody, Enrique dug around and, and, and found a source, and we worked really hard to get it. And we thought we could do a little more than we should. And that day, late in the day, seeing the people from the community stream in, just dead faces voting no, we voted, it was voting, that, uh, that bond was voted down three to one. Um, was a disheartening experience. And what I learned from that though, is that we as a board represent the entire community. We can't spend the entire community's money without them believing in it. And that's one thing they have to believe, the community has to believe that they're getting value from what we do, what happens to your children. And when people come and talk to us, you know, it takes six and a half average properties to pay for one student. It takes the tax levy from six and a half properties to pay for one student from town of Portland. It takes 11 from Peekskill to pay for one student. So if you have a couple of kids in the school, that means 12 other people or, or 12 other properties are paying for your kids to go to school. We have to be efficient of the Six school districts that are within Town of Portland and Peekskill, we have the highest cost per student. We have to work on ways to be efficient. Four years from now, that's going to change. So we have to start looking at ways to do it. And I'm throwing this out to Corey and other people. But when Joe talked about studies that are coming in the summer, we need people to be part of that. I want to talk about what's valuable to you got to be a part of those those conversations I've been reading the paper about how organizations are built by conversations we've got to have those conversations and when we talk about kind of budgets meetings menus uh, strategic plans those are all conversations we've got to have well but it's, we do implore you to please be part of that and, and you know because there will be these conversations coming And we've got to up to a little bit more. There's four parts of the budget. One is how much we spend per student. Another is how much state aid we get, how much tax levy we get, and what's the other part of the revenue. So those four parts, you know, in four years, if we want to get more state aid, we're going to have to come into line with the other districts around us on terms of how much we spend per student and how much tax levy we get for students. So we've got to come in line with that before we can start getting the state to talk to us about how much state aid is going to go up. So, you know, that's that's a big important conversation and how you do it is, is going to, we can continue being very successful, very exceptional school district. That's entirely possible. I trust in everybody in this room to be able to do that. But we've got to talk about it to get there. So while we're talking about it, as Joe said, you have to know what the community values. And if this is what they value, then that's something that we have to listen to and be cognizant. We have to work together with the people in the community to keep their trust in us that we're doing for everybody and every child and every parent and every student, you know, teacher, whatever, and, and our whole entire school community. So be involved. Thank you for coming in. And thank you.
you, Charles, one last time for your nine years. Um, if 
in between now and then, there are a tremendous amount of, um, of events, um, moving ups and honors, uh, you know, award ceremonies, and and you know, well, there's one or two committees, but the important thing is the concerts and the awards and the moving up ceremonies. And graduation will be shortly thereafter. So our next meeting will be two weeks from tonight, uh, June 21st, here at Hendrick Hudson High School in the library. Um, can I get a motion to close? Yes. Second? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.